Chapter 12 The Impossibility of Neutrality One of the key myths of humanism is the idea of neutrality. It is held that the mind of man can be neutral with regard to facts and ideas and that the scientific method is the way of neutrality. Man can, we are told, calmly and objectively approach and analyse facts and arrive at the truth. Such a view presupposes neutrality in the knower and the known. With respect to the knower, man, it assumes that man is not a fallen creature at war with his maker. Rather, man is held to be a being capable of approaching factuality objectively and impartially so that the basic judgments about the nature of things depends upon the mind of man. For us as Christians, this view is false. If man is not fallen and dead in sins and trespasses, then man can save himself. Man's reason can lead him to Christ without the grace of God. Man, however, is fallen in all his being. He is totally at war with God. Fallen man may manifest no hostility to God, but his indifference is equally an act of war because he has ruled out God from all consideration in all things. He has, in effect, declared that God is dead for him, and therefore need not even be considered or thought about. If my children act as though I do not exist, nor am to be thought about, spoken about, or referred to, then they, without a word said, are manifesting hatred of me, and are warring against me. Man is never neutral with respect to God, nor to anything that is of God. There is no neutrality in man. Similarly, there is no neutrality in facts, in the known. The idea that facts are neutral is a product of humanistic and evolutionary thought, which holds that facts, quote, just happened, end quote. They are ostensibly products of some cosmic accident and are thus uncommitted and meaningless facts. Hence man can study them without any religious commitments. They are a neutral realm of being. For us as Christians, however, all factuality is God-created and hence the meaning of all things, including man, can only be understood in terms of the triune God and his word. All things come from the hand of God and we do not grasp the meaning of anything if we deny its creator. The facts are never neutral because they are God-created. Those who ask us to be broad-minded and approach the world in all factuality with an quote, open and neutral end quote, mind are really asking us to presuppose a world which is the product of chance, not God. They are asking us to overlook the most critical factor of all, God the creator and to presuppose that facts are a product of chance. Cornelius Van Til has pointed out that, quote, The war between Christ and Satan is a global war. It is carried on first in the hearts of men, for the hearts of men, end quote. This war is a total war. As Van Til so powerfully states it, quote, There is not a square inch of ground in heaven or on earth, or under the earth, in which there is peace between Christ and Satan. And what is all important for us as we think of the Christian school is that, according to Christ, every man, woman and child is every day and everywhere involved in this struggle. No one can stand back refusing to become involved. He is involved from the day of his birth and even from before his birth. Jesus said, quote, He that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad, end quote. If you say you are, quote, not involved, end quote, you are in fact involved in Satan's side. If you say you are involved in the struggle between Christ and Satan in the area of the family and the church, but not in the school, you are deceiving yourself. In that case, you are not really fully involved in the family and in the church. You cannot expect to train intelligent, well-informed soldiers of the cross of Christ unless the Christ is held up before them as the Lord of culture as well as the Lord of religion. It is of the nature of the conflicts between Christ and Satan to be all-comprehensive. 
end quote. This total war is one which must be recognised, and education is at present perhaps the central theatre of war. Van Til is right, quote, There are two, and only two, mutually exclusive philosophies of education, end quote. These are Christian theistic and humanistic. Attempts to fuse the two are untenable, Matthew 6.24. This means that the teacher cannot be neutral nor subscribe to humanistic philosophies with respect to his field of study. Either there is a neutral void behind every fact, or the living God. In our teaching, we will always consciously or unconsciously acknowledge one or the other. In a neutral world, man stands as the sole voice of reason in a universal realm of irrationality. This makes man the high and ultimate judge and authority. The world is then under his interpretation and judgment so that man stands over reality as its only lord and master. Humanistic education fosters in its pupils the basic premises of Genesis 3.5. It asks man to be his own god, determining for himself what constitutes good and evil. Modern philosophies of education are often emphatic in declaring that there are no final answers, hence their hostility to the Bible. To assume final answers means that there is truth somewhere which stands apart from man and in judgment over man. To deny final answers and to affirm a perpetual quest and a perpetual revision of all answers is to affirm that it is not an answer or truth which is ultimate, but man. As a result, modern humanism is hostile to the idea of answers. It prefers to speak of tentative answers and of paradigms which provide tools for using reality, but never affirming any ultimate truth about reality. The ultimacy of man is thereby preserved. This is the meaning of progressivism and instrumentalism. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the truth, John 1.17. Jesus makes the same statement about himself. I am the truth, John 14.6. Humanistic education denies that truth is a person or a thing. Experientialism tells us that truth is what works for man. With respect to truth, Morris holds that, quote, Taken literally, the statement, I have found it, is not a scientific statement, but more in the nature of a theological one, end quote. Knowing is always a process, never a conclusion. The truth is always contingent and relative to man. This, of course, is a theological statement, but Morris's God is man. For us, also, truth is always contingent and relative, but to God, not man. The existentialist also makes truth relative to man and his existential choice. Truth is never abstract, nor is it some vague idea floating in the heavens. Truth is always relative to whatever is ultimate in our faith. If matter is ultimate for us, then truth is relative to matter. If mind to mind. If man is ultimate, then truth is contingent and relative to man. For us, however, all things having been created by the sovereign and triune God and relative to him and to his word, because the Lord is the ultimate and sovereign creator, he is therefore the truth in all its fullness, and all else is true in terms of its relation to him. The more we understand the relation of the physical world in relation to God in his order and purpose in creation, the more we know the truth about creation. The logic of the humanist position requires him to say that truth is relative and contingent to man and his society, because man is the ultimate truth. St. Paul was aware of this element of humanism in the Greco-Roman world of his day, and hence his indictment of it as, quote, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, end quote, 2 Timothy 3.7. Quote, ever learning, end quote, is rendered by the Berkeley version as, quote, forever getting information, end quote, Humanistic philosophies of education and these state schools are expressions of a religious faith, faith in man. 
Perkinson is right in speaking of, quote, the Americans' faith in their schools, end quote. Ours is another faith and we must stand in terms of it consistently and faithfully, 